podcast and YouTube blog covering the German startup scene with news, interviews, and live events. Hello and welcome everybody. This is Joe from Celebrate.io, your startup podcast and YouTube blog from Germany. I'm still at the Frankfurt Book Fair and I do have another finalist from the um, Content Shift Accelerator program, um, Andrew from Lovely London. As you guys may be able to see, we ordered London weather just for you. I brought Slight it all rain. with me. Nasty, gray, rainy, cold and miserable. Feels, was like looking home, right? for, hmm? Feels like home, right? Sadly, yes. I was looking forward to sunshine shine on warm weather like oh. last year mm, that would have been lovely you are here because you are the founder of a startup called jellybooks correct and you participate in the content shift accelerator correct can you give us a little brief wrap up what are you guys doing okay and how you ended up in like a german accelerator program from the publishers when mm -hmm. you're from london Yes, we are from London. Uh, we are an eight-year-old startup. When are you allowed to no longer call yourself a startup? You might ask. You can, you can. On my channel, but you can. No, the publishers asked us. Content Shift asked us. And I always joke, well, in publishing, everything takes a lot longer. So we should count eight years as only being two years. Um, <laughs> The majority of our clients, believe it or not, are German publishers. So we work a lot for Random House Germany, for the various parts of the whole spring groups, including Fischer, including Rowold, Basta Lübe, Holstein, and Simlon. UK publishers, US publishers also make up some of our revenue, but actually the minority. Um, we are London-based, but a distributed team. So we have people in Lyon, in Nantes, and London. Uh, for everybody who doesn't know both cities there in France. Indeed. So we are half French, actually. But I always like to say we are a European company, just to annoy Theresa May. <laughs> I myself originally from Copenhagen, Denmark, and we even have publishers who we work with there. Um, so the reason for us to participate in Content Shift was because we have so many German clients and we historically have done reader analytics, so we test books before they appear on the market with 500 to 800 test readers, give them a book that's published in three to 12 months and see how people read it, how to react to it and we can predict should this be a lead title for the publisher, a Spitzentitel or not, should they adjust the, public, um, the marketing budget. Uh, who is the audience? So we really do very product-focused kind of market research for publishers. That's what we've been doing for a few years. This year, we launched a new project called the Jellybooks Cloud Reader, how to read books in the cloud. We launched that in March at the Leipzig Book Fair with Random House. And as part of that project, we were also interested to develop closer relationships with the MVB, that's the commercial arm of the person for Ryan, as well as with German retailers like Talia, like Google and similar. So and for everybody who doesn't know the German market that are book resellers like Barnes and Nobles, for example. Or Waterstones in the UK, so yep. they, oper they occupy kind of that niche in the market. Yeah, physical retail stores. Correct. Yeah. But also Tolino is part of Content Shift, and that's the closest equivalent to, say, a Nook ecosystem or an ebook ecosystem. So we also have that angle represented in the jury and part of the competition or accelerator, because it's kind of a little bit of both, which can be confusing, uh, were represented. And it was for us to have a dialogue with them around what we're building now with publishers to integrate them into that platform and that system and that was part of the motivation for us to participate. Mm -hmm. Although they were, I think, a bit hesitant because they all knew us so well in the German market, they thought we were already past acceleration. But it was a new project, brand new, only six months in the market at the time. And so in that context, it made sense. And they took us into the semifinals and now the finals. And it's been great fun. Well, best of luck for tomorrow. There will be the award ceremony. But can we get a little bit back to the cloud reading mm -hmm. just from the position of a reader yeah how does it look and what's actually for you guys behind it okay so for the reader they might see an instagram post or a facebook post or get an email from the publisher and say here are the great books i have and here are the links and with one link you straight can start reading the book uh, usually much larger samples than average so up to 50 pages so really to give you an idea of this upcoming book that comes in a month's time like all our classical tools we monitor how people read so we are trying to get a sense what resonates with readers and we help publishers with their campaigns what kind of post 
pulls people in? How do they react? Do they read it? Do they convert to buying? So it's very marketing and sales oriented, but above all, it's also for readers to give them a really a better sense of the book. We know out of, of, out of our classical reader analytics research that if someone reads 30 to 50 pages in a book, they will finish the book. That's mm -hmm. about the critical amount of what you read. And so here we are really trying to optimize with publishers, how do you do audience generation? How do you build the audience for a book? Instead of relying purely on a physical bookseller or it will sell all by itself, which is still a radical concept for book publishers, that you actually have to go out and find the first 1,000 or the first 10,000 readers in the market. Mm -hmm. uh, when you said like they only read like the first uh, 30 to 50 pages, then they read the whole book. What came to mind was uh, Gabriel García Márquez, uh, how is it called, A Century of Loneliness? Uh, of Solitude. Of Solitude. A thousand years of solitude, if I remember correctly. Hundred, hundred, hundred years of solitude. Hundred years of solitude, yeah. I make it, it a thousand it, years, because it, it, in publishing, everything feels longer. <laughs> it, 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 it's just, it drags on at the beginning, mm -hmm. but then you get hooked. You have to get your beginnings right. People today don't have the patience. So when we had the first iteration of the cloud reader, mm -hmm. we still relied on people saying, I want to scroll, I want to paginate. You have both groups of readers, but people have no attention these days, especially not with samples. So we can change the whole thing. If you start scrolling, we reconfigure the whole book for you to be a scroller. And when you come out of Facebook or Instagram, people are more likely to scroll through a book. You land on a sample on the publisher's website, you're more likely to turn the page and we can automatically detect it and adapt it. And as part of the program we also propose to build an audio version of the cloud reader to read or listen to audio books and I say we shall books. and we shall detect when you fall asleep. We listen in on you and then tell you you left off here, this is the minute where you need to reconvene from your book. So it's a different way of how we apply analytics and data collection to create user benefits. And basically you enable like publishers like audio and book publishers to do like A-B testing like you do in we software. We do that as well. So we do A-B testing of covers on books. Um, mm -hmm. We also A-B test samples and with covers and descriptions and see which version works better. We are totally data and analytics driven in an industry that's not used to using data at all. A-B testing is a radical concept for book publishers. But you can ruin a book with a cover. They all say never judge a book by its cover. Everyone judges a book by its cover, but it doesn't just affect whether you pick a book. What most readers don't realize, and publishers were surprised, the book cover also influences if you recommend a book. And that's an entirely subconscious behavior. So if I recommend you a book, I'm influenced by the cover of the book because I'm judged by you on what I recommend to you. And subconsciously, if I don't like the cover, I'm not going to recommend that book to you either. So designing the book covers is not about just how it looks in the bookshop, but if you as a reader will pass it on, and books are totally dependent in terms of sales on word of mouth, on people telling other people about the book. That's what drives every big success in this market. And so we have also tried a lot of research and continuing research to predict which books have higher word of mouth potentials. Because you can have books people really enjoy, but they don't want to tell anybody else about it. They're literally shades of gray. guilty pleasures, <laughs> except that one they actually all talked about, which is the amazing thing. But, but, but I assume just only after some time, right? And I think it was also a mass media phenomenon yep. where mass media talked about how everyone <laughs> was reading this and not everyone wanted to admit to reading it. Mm. But you, you have some genres, the more erotic a book becomes, the less likely you are going to recommend it to a general <laughs> friend. Okay. Also, um, the more gruesome it gets in a thriller or horror story, uh, you're less likely to recommend it. Mm -hmm. Generally, anything with feelings only women read and men don't. But anything... What do men read and women don't? Is, is there like a genre? Um, very hard-hitting thrillers, mm -hmm. political thrillers, a little bit more men than women. Mm -hmm. Science fiction is much more female than people imagine, but if you look very much at hard sci-fi and space opera, you're probably a bit more at the male nerdish end than the female side. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, even male-on-male -male romance novels are mostly women, not men. <laughs> so, yeah, women make up most of the readers in the industry all across the board. I mean, the, the highest percentage of male readers we ever had on a book we tested 
was um, a biography or history book on the Wright brothers. That was really 70% male audience, the beginning mm -hmm. of aviation and the history of the Wright yeah, brothers. Yeah, I, I, I just... Very techy books. Yeah. I just realized with my taste in like science fiction and space opera, <laughs> I'm at the very nerdy end. Okay, that's... Final and audio books are more male than female, so that is I love one of audio books. That is a genre that pulls more men into books than printed books do. Uh, yes, maybe because and podcasts and are a gateway drug into audio books, and it whets the appetite for it. But also, you know, non-fiction. There is no such thing as a male book or woman's book. One shouldn't categorize it. We see more influence sometimes by age. Some books appeal older groups, some go younger. We've done studies on how your TV and film viewing influences whether you like a book or not. So we once tested a book where the agent told the publishers this was for Game of Thrones fans. And Game of Thrones fans only finished the book at a percentage of 30%, which is very, very low. But if you were a Viking or Last Kingdom fan, you finished the book 60-70% completion rate. So the publisher had gotten the positioning completely wrong. Uh, when you said uh, like certain books are just coming with a certain age, for example, every time I see the decline and the fall of the Roman Empire at someone's nightstand, night desk, usually they're above 55. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even read the book yet, which tells you I'm not quite yet at 55. A few more years to go. I have um, <laughs> of course, a lot of young adults is read by women and readers much, much older than 18. And we showed that to publishers, how much the audience is much older than a young adult audience. On the other hand, we once had a book no one over 35 read, and it was not explicitly geared to a younger audience, but it used so much specific language as used by millennials or modern jargon that older readers couldn't get into the book. And so the language used in the book limited it to people under 35. That was not intentional, but that came out of the results. But well, it was the language in the book that it limited the audience to, not the content, not the storyline. I could actually listen to you for a few more hours, but unfortunately, <laughs> you have to run to your yes, next appointment. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. We are linking your LinkedIn profile, your okay. website down here in the show notes, as well as Content Shift. Okay. With such a pleasure having you here. My pleasure. And keep Thanks in mind, if somebody has Game of Thrones in the bookshelf, only 30% of those people finished the books. Uh, I didn't tell you which book that was we were testing. <laughs> Thank because you. the publisher would kill me if I said it. That's all, folks. Find more news, streams, events, and interviews at www.startuprad.io. Remember, sharing is caring.